Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Albany State University. And as we say, the unsinkable Albany State University. Many of you know that we've had a tumultuous couple of weeks here on campus due to Hurricane uh, Michael. Uh, we actually were out for over a week and we are back, we're in business, we're back to normal. We're glad to have you on campus with us. And we'd like to welcome all of you from uh, Bethune-Cookman, from East Georgia State College, Georgia College, Marshall University and University of West Georgia. We're happy to have you here. I can tell you that a week ago, the campus was devastated. There were trees everywhere, there was damage. Uh, we actually had to send students from that remained in the dorms to Savannah for a few days before they could come back. We're back. We're glad to have you here. Just two quick uh, housekeeping notes. Number one, those of you that are scheduled to present in 141, which is just right next door in the hallway to the auditorium here, the seats have been removed. They're being replaced in that classroom. So those of you that were to present in 141, Look at your schedule, and I'll remind you again before we leave. You're going to give your presentations right here in this auditorium, in this theater. Okay? So anyone scheduled this morning or this afternoon in room 141 will present here right where you are at the present time. Okay? Uh, and I'll remind you after we get done with our keynote address where you'll be going for lunch. As I said, we were out for a week and we're back to some semblance of normalcy. And part of the reason that we were only out of week is due to the leadership of our upper administration. And certainly Dr. Uh, Marion Fedick uh, led that effort, the great effort, and got us back within a week of the hurricanes. She's unable to be with us this morning. She's still dealing with things on campus. So she brings her welcome to you. Uh, also, thanks go to Dr. Raj Parikh, our uh, interim provost and vice president. He's with us, and he'd like to welcome you as well. Dr. Parikh. Good morning. I'd like to add uh, my welcome to all of you and also bring greetings from President Frederick. She's been unable to be here, but she really wanted to convey her um, Greetings and also how uh, how she's very supportive of, of undergraduate research as as um, as a University we need to encourage people to get into research and and continue the quest for knowledge So um, how many of you here are presenting papers or po poster sessions? Would you raise your hand, please? Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to walking around and, uh, and hearing your poster presentation and also to listen to some presentations. One of the things that's delightful about a university is the ability to find the truth, to find knowledge. And that's what research teaches you to do. Many of us have prior notions about things. So, um, so one of the things that research enables us to do is to test whether or not a hypothesis or a notion is correct, okay? And one of the things that you learn through this process of research is the research methodology, okay? Research methodology is something that we are not born with. It is something we have to learn. And it's a scientific process of systematically investigating uh, an issue. So for example, we know that opioids kill people. We don't know to what extent uh, people must use opioids in order to put their lives in danger. So we, that's a research question. So we form a hypothesis, we collect the data, and then we either accept the hypothesis or reject it. And then other people who come after us take the research we have done and build on it. So, your participation in research is just the first step. If you decide to go to graduate school, you'll be doing more research. If you decide to get a doctorate, you will really get deeply into research, into some original material. And, and this training will be, will be very helpful in, in that process. For people who are not planning to go into research in graduate school, this is still very good training because it teaches you how to 
uh, disabuse people of misinformation. See, everything that is reported on the web is not accurate. There are a lot of, there's a lot of junk science that goes on. And, and a, a good researcher knows how to differentiate between junk science and real science. So I think that this training will be very helpful to you and I look forward to seeing your, uh, to hearing your presentations and seeing your posters. Good luck to you, thank you. I apologize, I did not introduce myself appropriately. I'm Dr. Claire Fox Hillard and I'm a professor of music in our Department of Visual and Performing Arts and it's my pleasure to be your presiding officer. I'll see you again midday and I'll see you again at the end when we get to our uh, placement and awards. Um, Dr. Okonkwo, would you like to speak or would you like to, I, I'd like to introduce Dr. Okonkwo, who many of you know. He is going to give some acknowledgments and then he is also our keynote speaker. Thank you, I can reintroduce you. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much for coming here today to join us and make presentations as well. Uh, this is our seventh uh, fall undergraduate research symposium. Essentially, we have uh, hosted this symposium for seven years at this university. Uh, I'll use this opportunity to thank the students and welcome both our students as well as those who have traveled from different places to come to Albany State today. Uh, just as uh, Dr. Hillard and, of course, our provost, Dr. Parikh, have said, uh, we've been dealing with quite a few challenges on campus uh, since after the hurricane. So we are happy that we are able to make uh, this undergraduate research symposium happen this year. Uh, we thank the colleges that have uh, just arrived and who, are, who decided to join us today, and we thank our students. Uh, where is uh, Ms. Uh, Yemisi Millage? Where is Ms. Millage? Uh, Ms. Millage is our assistant director. I think she's still walking around, trying to make sure things are working. Um, I do believe that when I left her in the office at about 7.30 p.m. last night, she must have le gone home around 4 o'clock this morning to come back here by six this morning to make sure things are running. So we thank her very much. Uh, Dr. Hill, uh, Dr. Hillard, uh, being the presiding officer, is going to go through and guide us throughout the day, uh, both uh, in the area of oral presentation and uh, in the area of uh, poster presentations. Uh, we, we thank uh, our president, President Frederick, for all the support uh, she gives to the Center for Undergraduate Research, as well as uh, Dr. Parikh, who is our provost and who we report to. Uh, he makes sure that we're doing what we, what we say we're going to do. So we thank him very much even for being here this morning. Uh, so things will run well today. I know quite a few students are not here this morning. Uh, by 10 o'clock, most people will be around, so please go to the rooms in which you're going to make presentation. Uh, I've been the director for the Center for Undergraduate Research over the last three years. Uh, I am happy to announce that I will be exiting that position uh, because I'm now the interim dean, so I've been told that I need to pack my things and leave, which is a good thing. Uh, so I was still going to be working close, closely with the center uh, because I believe in undergraduate research. Uh, I've been a mentor since I arrived here 20 years ago. Uh, most have mentored at least 35 students. And some of them have gone to receive PhDs in different areas, in, especially in the mathematical sciences. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, one of my students who I mentored in 2004 uh, called me. He's the chair of the math department at Florida State College in Jacksonville. So we're, we're making progress. So thank you again for coming this morning. Uh, we're happy you're here.
Thank you, Dr. Okonkwa. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Okonkwa again uh, as our keynote speaker, and I think how appropriate that is after his years of work with the center and now moving on. Uh, in a sense, I think it's fair to say that he's a man who does not need an introduction for those of you who have participated in this event before. Certainly those of us on campus know him, and you can read his biography in your program. But I think it's uh, n worthy to note uh, his scholarship, his degrees, earning his BS degree in mathematics and education, first class honors uh, from the University of Lagos in Nigeria, also graduating with a Master of Philosophy and Engineering in 1985 uh, from the University of Texas at Arlington, and then also with his PhD in mathematics. And I think his dissertation is worthy of note. His dissertation was the control problems in the class of linear quadratic systems, where he examined you know, control problems centered in discrete systems, function spaces, and stochastic systems, and obtained several results from that and subsequently was published. He's written nearly 40 scholarly papers, uh, 70 papers uh, at scholarly meetings, presentations. So he's well known not only in our community, but around the country and indeed the world. Uh, we know him on campus. He's served in many capacities. You can read about those in your programs. But I think what's n noteworthy about Dr. Okonkwo is that although he was trained as a teacher, he still exemplifies that passion for teaching. And, you know, he believes that applied mathematics are part of his responsibility to examine real-life problems and seek meanings of solving them. Uh, he believes that most real-life problems involve identification of these problems characterization of the problems by examining its parts or uh, phases and creating ways for solving those problems. Um, he believes that mathematics create a strong foundation for the development of the human intelligence. And being in the arts, I might add that that mathematics along with the arts uh, contribute to a complete person and early childhood learning is uh, uh, vital to that. Uh, he believes that these mathematic multiplication, for example, should be learned before a, stu a child is five years old and therefore should be able to use mathematics in patterns, uh, seen and unforeseen, and that parents play an invaluable part in that. Uh, he believes that, you know, kitchen table discussion should involve mathematics. So we look forward to hearing from Dr. Okonkwa. Uh, please help me welcome him back as our keynote speaker, Dr. Okonkwa. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hillard, for that wonderful presentation. Um, when I was appointed uh, the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, early August this year, uh, I knew right away that uh, my time at the Center for Undergraduate Research was going to be a little bit shorter. But what I did not know was that I, I was going to be the keynote speaker in this year's undergraduate research symposium. So one day I was in my office and uh, Ms. Millage, who is the assistant director, and as well as Ms. Dre uh, Black, our ad admin assistant, came to me and told me that since I was going to be exiting the position, that they would like me to be the keynote speaker. Uh, I accepted. And I started thinking about what I was going to talk about. Over the last several years, uh, Dr. Owa, who is my colleague here, and I have been talking about one of the challenges we see in, in a lot of physical uh, phenomena, as well as uh, when we talk about uh, situations. Uh, someone can say, well, I am more qualified than you are. Uh, another person will say that uh, I'm a better student than you are. Uh, so I decided, well, what I'm going to do is for us to discuss the whole idea of measure. So um, if we're able to collect essential data, quality data, you can place a measure on that data. That's the only way you can know 
what you are talking about. And using that measure, you can compare uh, objects uh, in that set, whether you are talking about a set of students in a college or individuals who are looking for a job in a corporation and so on and so forth. There must be a measure. So I decided to entitle my presentation today as uh, the numbers that count. Data and measures are the new frontier. So if you, if you collect data, that is fine. You also need to collect data that makes sense. And we're going to begin this presentation with uh, a discussion. Uh, Mary is 18 years old and his brother Tony is 10 years old. Their mother aunt gives Mary $34 to share with Tony. How much money does Tony get? The first time I gave this problem in my class, college algebra class, you know, the students thought I put a trivial question there, so they decided to divide the money, divide um, the 34 into two. I said, Tony gets uh, 17, $17. I just, I just gave them zero. Because we have two people now, so what they did was they divided into two. I, ne I never said that the money was going to be divided into two equal parts. I didn't say that. So, as you know, in, in many uh, families, uh, if Mary is kind enough, Mary could give $24. If Mary doesn't like give her the money because she already planned to do something with the $34. Mary will go close to Tony and tell Tony, I'm going to keep this money. You better not tell mama. If you tell mama, I beat you up. So Tony will end up getting zero. So what is the answer to this question? In the subsequent problem I gave to my students, the students say, it depends. So definitely, Tony is not going to get a negative number. So the number has to be between zero and what? $34. So in real life situations, open problems are sometimes presented and you are told to figure out the answer. OK, so we, we have this next one. Uh, I live in this zip code, 31721. That is, uh, uh, if you live in Northeast Albany or you live in part of uh, Lee County uh, or even close to the airport or towards Becker County, all of us are in this um, 31721. So you have a millionaire. Actually, we have quite a few millionaires that live over there. Uh, so you have a millionaire living there who makes $20 million and and the, someone with the least uh, income makes $10,000. Uh, and the, the mean income is $95,000. So how many people live with income, um, with income live in that area? Well, if it is individual who presented this problem gave us uh, the standard deviation of, uh, or the variance of, of the distribution of incomes. Uh, uh, in addition, stated that we have a normal distribution, that is we have normality, we could make some predictions about the percentage of, of the individuals who have a certain income within one standard deviation away from the mean. Or two standard deviation away from the mean. Or three standard deviation away from the mean, which would be 99.99% of people. So, but he didn't tell us anything. So we can't really say the number of people that live in that zip code. Now, this one looks a little bit mathematical. So uh, we have a set. Uh, we, we define set. Sometimes I ask my students to define a set. Uh, sometimes my students will say that a set is a collection of objects. I say no. A set is not a collection of objects. A set is a collection of well-defined objects. So you have to characterize those objects to define a set. So 
those objects have to have some relationship. So if you have a set, and um, this set I'm talking about here is countable. For example, the set of positive integers is countable. But it's infinite. That is, you can count positive integers from now to the end of time. It's, you're still counting. So you can, you can put a measure on that set. Uh, that is, if you have two integers which are different from each other, positive integers, for example, they are diff there's a difference between them. That is, if you have 4 and 5, there's a difference. Or 5 and 10, there's a difference. So if there's a difference, we we'll call that 1. Uh, if they're the same, you can put that measure to 0. So, so you don't have to repeat that. So it is a measure you're putting on this set. So depending on what the set is and depending on the, the members of that set, you can put a measure on it. Now, when we, when we give students exams and you, you're taking five courses, uh, say you, you have a course in college algebra like I teach every semester, I, I place students in different categories depending on the scores they make. At the end of the semester, some students get A, some students get B, some students get C. So if you get A in college algebra, then you, you have uh, a GP, uh, uh, the grade point there will be four, right? You, you get a four, four credits, you have uh, four. But if you have a B, you get three. If you have C, you get two. So, so these are weighted, weighted uh, norms. All right, so I decided to, to get this one. Uh, you have uh, an individual is trying to collect information. Uh, and he decides to uh, generate this information. And this information is supposed to be empirically collected. So you have somebody who's a novice who makes mistakes 2 o'clock in the morning. is trying to put data together. And he collects this 34. 36 uh, data points. And this is supposed to be the distribution of ages of people. Ages, right? So we, we can place this problem on a basic statistics uh, 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 exam and tell students to find the mean standard deviation and maybe draw some, uh, some charts and histograms and so on and so forth. So Remember that we were talking about ages of human beings here. So if you look at this, you will see quite a few challenges here. Okay, so let us discuss this data. And whether all the data points here really count. The last time I checked, I've not seen someone who is negative 18 years old. So this person collects this information and submits for data analysis. Um, somebody who is 160 years old, it looks like we, we may be doing an anniversary of the person's, uh, 40th anniversary of the person's death. Definitely not, not that person is living. So, so you can collect this kind of information, but what are you going to do with it? All right. So um, we, we have this. Uh, data. To begin with, we don't have people who are whose ages are negative. Secondly, uh, if you have uh, a radix of 100 individuals, um, we're going to be talking the language of uh, basic demography now. The radix is the number of Birds in a cohort. So you have L0, which is a radix of 100,000 people. The US Census Bureau uses uh, this number as the radix. So uh, you have a sequence of, of uh, numbers L1, L2, L3, X meaning the year. So, so this goes supposedly goes from X equals 0, which is a radix 100. 100,000 bats uh, to infinity. So I don't know what you know, infinity here is funny. But anyway, we know that as x continues to get large, 
LX is going to be zero because people don't live forever. So all these people who were born this year will die, whether they like it or not. Okay, so um, you do know that when children are, are born, if we have 100,000 live births in a year, by the end of that year, some of them must have died. So we call DX the number of people that die in the year X. So to get the X, you look at LX minus LX plus one. So if you sum up that, the number of people who, who die in that cohort will be equal to the number of people who were born to begin with that year. All of them will die. So the number of graves you see, well, let me use, not use graves, so people may not want to get buried, but the number of people that die will be equal to the number of people that, uh, that were born. Uh, for example, in 2010, you have this number. So out of the 100,000 people who were born, uh, at, the age of, at the age of 100, only 173 of them were still living. So the probability of being alive after 100 years is very, very small. People lived in 95. Between 95 and 100, most people die. Essentially, between 95 and 105, the rest of them who have been living and surviving on medication and so on, people get wiped out. So I, I, I'm using this example to say that when you collect information, you need to collect information, you have to understand the background of the information and whether all the data you have in that set count. Uh, if they don't count and you analyze the data, and you use that data for, use the result for decision making, any decision you make thereafter will be wrong. For example, uh, the insurance industry needs to know this every year. So the Census Bureau as well as the insurance industry needs to know how many people who are living. The US Census Bureau actually provides some of this information. But the insurance industry also know how many people that survive in a certain zip code or in a certain block every year. They want to know that in order to cost you. Now, as human beings, we, we look at data all the time, talk about data, 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 uh, without realizing that we are the generators of a lot of data. We generate data every day. So if you've looked at your cell phone this morning or you've made a call, or you've seen a doctor over the last one year, uh, or you've paid school fees, or you've received a grade, or you're driven from here to Atlanta, you've been generating data, you've been generating information, and this information is collected. So let us look at uh, uh, a set that co contains N people. Now I'm using uh, P, like one person is just an object. It can be any object. So that, that person can be looked at as a point in N space. That is how do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, the same person goes to the hospital. The same person goes to college. The same person drives to Atlanta. The same person makes calls. So each of these will constitute information. And there are also some of the information which are qualitative, they don't have to be quantitative all the time. So assuming that we have uh, this information for every member of S, we, we can regard that member as a point in n-dimensional in Euclidean space, which you call Rn. So because you have n coordinates there for every person. So you generate all this information. 
we can decide to place a measure on that set. And we call this measure a norm. We can place a, a measure. So for every set, we can identify an appropriate measure. Well, for, for distance, that measure may be the length between that point and another point or a reference point. Now, this is what uh, I do when I, uh, this is the first, one of the first things we, we talk about when, we, when I teach a course in operations research. If you're going to be able to solve a problem, you need to have what you call a full description of the problem. You need to understand this problem. Uh, Dr. Parikh talked about research methodology today. You need to be able to identify the problem and characterize the problem appropriately. So in operations research for uh, the problems we solve, we need to understand uh, the problem and look at the data sources. So it's only when we do that that we, we formulate a mathematical model or a model which represents the problem. So it is the data you collect and the data source that will determine the kind of formulation you're going to have. So once you do that, being well-educated people, we uh, we develop methods for solving the problem. We test uh, and modify the model. Uh, we, we need to document the, uh, the steps. Just as you are doing research, you need to document the steps you take in the research process. So when you get a result, someone else should be able to replicate the same work you've done and say, yes, this result is correct. One of the challenges we had, for example, um, this two weeks ago when Hurricane Michael hit us here, was I, I, was, I was watching the Weather Channel, and one of the things I heard from the Weather Channel was that we're going to have a storm surge of between nine feet and... 15 feet. Uh, well, that was what the model told them. But when the storm surge came, they had a storm surge of 26 feet. Well, uh, if I were the person in charge of uh, this modeling, uh, those who created those models, I would like to send them back to school. It was 26 feet and 15 feet, the difference is extremely huge. I mean, the difference between them is like uh, picking a small rock and throwing at something, or picking up this building and throwing on something. It is huge in terms of force. So that's why we, we lost all these people, and the thing came here and hit all of us. And some of us are still working on our houses trying to get back to it today. Now, in linear programming, for example, we want to uh, define a problem this way. In LP problems, we want to maximize uh, a function we call an objective function subject to certain constraints. This is a typical problem we do, so there's always constraint. For example, if you have a business, that P may be a profit. Uh, if you are trying to create a model for a car manufacturer who manufactures different kinds of cars, like the GM, so uh, the AIs, which are the coefficients of uh, a linear combination we have there for P, may represent what you call marginal profit. And the AIJs, uh, we represent, uh, rather, alpha, alpha ij. So we represent what we call 
the technological coefficients. This deal with cost and so on and so forth. You might, you might have labor constraint there, you may have money constraints, you may have storage constraints, you have all these constraints. But you are supposed to solve this problem in such a way that will maximize the profit. Well, this problem will be solvable if you have a set of numbers, the, the AIs and the alpha IJs, that are actually adequately obtained. So if you mix these things up and you collect the wrong information, you're going to get the wrong solution and your company is going to close. So that's what I mean by trying to make sure you have the adequate measures and the numbers that count. Well, today we, we talk about big data everywhere. Everyone talks about big data, big data sources. Um, big data includes a large amount of data that are generated today, both structured and unstructured uh, data. And because big data is big by itself, uh, it is very difficult for people today to be able to use a calculator or, or analyze this kind of information by hand. So we use, we use technology or software uh, and that's an area that is still developing today. So for you to analyze uh, uh, big data, you, you use the method of analytics. Um, sometimes we call it data analysis, we call, we call it analytics. analytics. Analytics is actually uh, the old operational research, but in a more general term. That's what we call data analytics today. So uh, these are data sources. So when you are looking for, uh, looking at big data, you need to know the sources of this data, whether it is structured or unstructured. You need to know where this data is coming from. And never use Never use fake data. And there are ways now, many ways have been developed how, uh, how you can actually filter your data. So um, um, this is a little bit more mathematical here. So uh, I, I start to say that if you have a set, you can, you can divide this set into subsets uh, uh, which do not have any intersections. You can have this put on in subsets or classes. So uh, there are different ways uh, this data is treated. But for every subset here, you can place a measure on that subset. Place a measure. And this measure gives you the tool to distinguish between one object and another. So for those of you in math, you understand what I mean by intersection uh, VQ is empty. That is, you put them in classes in such a way that there are no common elements. Well, you, you can look at every element in any of these subsets as an n vector in the simplest way. But most of the time, uh, objects change. They may change with time directly. They can also change due to other information or due to chance. Uh, I've not talked about that today, but that's what we do. Well, I'm going to... Uh, conclude this work. I know that uh, it's a short time and I decided to make it short by saying the following. Number one, when you have a collection of information, you must make sure that this collection of information or what we are doing is the right part. You have this information, make sure you have 
the data that you're supposed to use. The only way you can make sure is to also describe your data sources. If you have your data sources, you can only use the data that comes from that source, not from another fake source. You cannot pray your way out of it. Well, let me do this and try and see. Or uh, put this number here and see whether it works or not. No. In research methodology, you need to be able to describe your, your data source. You also need to describe the process in which you're going to be able to solve the problems. And as I as mentioned, just as most of you are researchers yourselves, that you should only use the information that counts. Because if the information does not count, your result also will be defective. Thank you. Again, we're delighted to have you here today. I wish you all a wonderful time. Uh, and we're, uh, we'll reconvene back in here around 4 o'clock, or around 4.15, for the announcements of our placements and, uh, and then adjourn from here. So again, welcome. Have a wonderful day.